when you say that science and spirituality are synergistic and unfortunately science is being preferred over spirituality and that's just a very uh, myopic view uh, where you are taking one side of the coin and disregarding the other because no true scientist can ever not be spiritual spirituality is the journey of insight So you have studied mathematics at IIT and uh, soon after that you experienced meditation and you realized that you wanted to teach meditation so people could be happy as opposed to teaching mathematics to make people miserable. <laughs> I loved my, reading my that. My maths classes are quite interesting as well. That people are not miserable in my maths class either. <laughs> I, I don't doubt it. And you are a polymath of sorts. You know, it seems that you love music, classical music. You're a foodie. You love long walks. You're passionate about the environment, and and of course, you're a renowned uh, speaker on on TEDx stages all over India. And and I truly loved this book. Uh, sleep your way to success. Um, and, and, you know, I've heard you talk about how our species is really the only species on the planet Earth that willingly deprive ourselves of sleep. Right. And, and, and how, how crazy is that when we could bask in the glory of being human, as you say, but instead, because we're not sleeping, we're dull, we're restless, we're anxious, we are fearful. You also go on to say that people walk around jet lagged. They don't know that their sleep is compromised. And it's interesting, when I first started meditating, I was falling asleep while I meditated. And that was my first sign to me that I was sleep deprived. But for people who don't meditate, what can you say to people about some of the signs or what they can do to better understand that they might be sleep deprived, but they don't know it? So <clears throat> that is the problem with uh, sleep deprivation, that the person who is sleep deprived doesn't know it. Your body just copes and copes and copes and copes. And sometimes it goes into something called a micro nap where you kind of, you know, just fall asleep for two, three seconds. And uh, it can be funny, embarrassing, but it can also be very dangerous, especially if you're driving. <laughs> so, you know, uh, drunk driving causes so many accidents, so many problems. But drowsy driving causes four times more. Wow. People falling asleep at the wheel. In fact, uh, one of our friends, one of my friends in Germany died in a car crash because a truck driver hit his car and the truck driver had fallen asleep on the, on the wheel. So it can be quite tragic. And this is the thing, when you are sleep deprived, you don't know you're sleep deprived. And uh, many people say, oh, I can get by with four hours, five hours of sleep. No, there's no problem. You don't know there is a problem. That's the problem. <laughs> Yes. So sleep science says that at a minimum, all of us require eight hours of sleep opportunity every night. And if we are physically active, you know, if you're doing some gymming, we are exercising, we are doing some sports, something like that, then you may require more. But otherwise, as a baseline, people require eight hours of sleep. Of course, children require much more. Yes. You know, you talked in your book about the importance of being in rhythm with the planet, with our environment, with their circadian rhythms of the sunset, of the sunrise. I would love to hear from you, your personal routine that con connects you to these rhythms. And you spoke about groundedness a little bit in your book as well. 
the walking um, barefoot and, and such. Could you share with us what your daily routine is? <laughs> it varies, but I always have my meals more or less on time. I ensure that I meditate an hour, hour and a half every day. I ensure that I sleep eight hours every night. Uh, and I ensure that I get at least a little bit of exercise, even if it is just walking. Though it's nice to do stretching and, you know, some sort of weight sometimes. Like today, I, I'm in Rishikesh right now on the banks of the Ganga. So I just had a lovely evening walk. I watched the sunset and then I took a long walk and I came back. So Beautiful. watching the sunset is, is very nice. It's yeah. very good for sleep because it gives very good signals to the brain that the day is turning towards night. Right. So I remember with my mom and dad, when I was very young, we used to go to Shivaji Park in, in Bombay to watch the sunset over there. It, it's, it's a beach. And uh, now I watch it whenever I'm in Rishikesh. And uh, thank, thankfully, we are in Rishikesh quite often now because we teach the craniosacral therapy course over here and the advanced meditation course of the art of living we teach over here. So every evening, you know, we ensure that we spend at least an hour on the beach of the Ganga, watching the river, watching the sunset. That makes a lot of difference to the way, you know, you get sleep and, and your entire well-being. Really. Yes, absolutely. It's beautiful. And with us living in these dense urban cities with all the light and our inability to watch the sunset is harmful um, in, in so many ways. I'd like to talk a little bit about your philosophy, too. You are someone who really delves into the ancient wisdoms of, of the rishis. And I want to say a, a quote that you, you said in a video that I watched of you. India is the only civilization in which science and spirituality are, were never at loggerheads with each other. In fact, all were scientists and saints. They knew uh, that to go our, outside, you had to go yeah, inside. All our, all our scientists were saints. Uh, we're saints. We're yeah. saints. Science is going outside. Spirituality is going inside. Yes. This is the most important message India has for the world. I found that incredibly profound. And, and you went on to say that the rishis knew through meditation, the soil on the, the moon, the yeah. color of it. They knew that the earth was round. And this was centuries prior to the discoveries um, we hear about in the West. Correct. Can you expand on this power of meditation that these rishis had and why we are in the situation where we are valuing science over spirituality when they are truly synergistic? Well, <clears throat> so see, I'm not, not an expert on ancient history. Uh, I just, it's a hobby. It's something I love reading. Um, but I have seen enough in my own life when I'm, you know, as I meditate, how things are so somehow obvious to me and other people don't see it. Yes. You know? Yes. And uh, it is not so much of a stretch of imagination for me to to understand that these people definitely had some very interesting abilities. In fact, uh, a few years ago in our Bangalore ashram, there was this man, he had come. His name is Adunik Bhim. You can Google him also if you want. Well built, huge guy. And uh, he did some incredible physical feats. Uh, you know, he, he crushed glass with his hands. And, I mean, he did it right in front of us, but those were still all right. What was most intriguing and amazing, and I was part of the experiment there, was that he could stop his heart for over three minutes. Like he invited me to put my hand on his chest and said, there is no heartbeat. Can you feel my heartbeat? And I couldn't feel the heartbeat. 
you know so uh though it sounds like science fiction i have actually seen this and experienced it and so i guess with enough discipline with enough time with enough focus uh the secrets of creation could be revealed just through meditation right uh and you're right when you say that science and spirituality are synergistic and unfortunately science is being preferred over spirituality and that's just a very uh myopic view uh where you are taking one side of the coin and disregarding the other because no true scientist can ever not be spiritual spirituality is the journey of insight when you when you are exploring the outside surely you are curious about who you are right so spirituality answers the question who are you whereas science answers the question what is this right and i think both of them are very close to each other yes it's it's beautifully said and as you know albert einstein was mm. was incredibly spiritual in yeah. in the way he thought about the complexity of of the problems and the problems that he wanted to solve and i wanted to go back on on touching on your idea of how we've put more value into science and it is indeed linked to this idea that success is defined by our external external measures of material wealth or status or fame and that obviously you have talked a lot about in the book and uh the idea is for us to redefine success not internalize society's definition of success and you've talked to thousands and thousands of people especially young younger people who have a harder time understanding what success is to them and thus they get into these uh cycles of of uh sleep deprivation thinking that the less they sleep the more successful they will be what is your advice to them in terms of defining success in a healthy way and what is your current definition of success hmm. success is different for everybody and my invitation to everybody is you define it for some people it can be materialistic it can be i want x amount of money in the bank for other people it could be health for other people it could be health and money for others it could be fantastic relationships right so different people have different parameters by which they define success and that's what we have done in the book we have allowed people the freedom to create their own uh blueprint of success right and the great part is it doesn't matter what the blueprint what success looks like to you the path towards it is more or less the same uh which is what the second part of the book is all about as far as my definition of success is concerned <laughs> happy healthy wise and wealthy there you go i love it i love <laughs> it perfect i i also want to lastly touch on something that you so brilliantly um uh indicated in the book and 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 crafted this idea of action addiction and i've never seen it talked about in this manner you talk about the addiction to busyness and oh. you connected to dopamine hits so oh. the reason why we are in these cycles of getting things done having a, a list of to do's being on our phone checking our emails so much of it is because we actually get the dopamine reward from it right. can you expand on the addictive nature of these small useless activities that we involve ourselves every day that are purposeless 
meaningless and don't provide us with the inspiration, the juice we need to live a glory, a life of glory that we, we really should be living. See, dopamine is a, is a hormone which the brain releases whenever something is done. And then there are other parameters as well, like uh, gambling produces dopamine. When the result is not uh, sure, it's not certain, and there are odds, and that produces dopamine. And then if you get the result, you get even more dopamine. So just think about it this way, then, you know, if you have posted something on Instagram and then you are going to check five minutes later, how the post is doing. So you don't know whether you're going to have a few likes on it or not. Right. So that's your dopamine kick there. And then you look at it and, and you see, Oh, I've got 23 likes. Oh, wow. And that's another dopamine kick. Yeah. Right. And, and so you want that again. So in a few minutes, again, you check. And now the 23 likes have gone to 28 likes and so, oh, it's growing and it's another dopamine kick. And this kind of cycle of addiction is created in doing, I wouldn't say it's purposeless. You are having fun, uh, but it is trivial and it is pedestrian. And the point is that it is taking you away from what you truly want in life, right? So having the ability to use this brain chemistry to your advantage is a great skill. And yes. again, we have touched upon it uh, quite uh, in quite deep, quite amount of detail in, in the success part of Sleep Yoga to Success. Yes. Yes. I want to finish by um, reading you a quote from this book dedicated to Gurudev. The one who awakens us by making us close our eyes. And I have underlined it here. It is most profound and most important for our life. What has meditation done for you? And how has it awakened you and awakened your life? anything and everything good yeah because of meditation even pizza tastes better after meditation <laughs> so yeah. it makes you meditation <coughs> excuse me meditation enhances your senses so yeah. you get more juice out of life you get more enjoyment out of everything you do it creates tremendous health benefits you are you feel younger you look younger uh you even biologically, if you check, you you have not aged as much as you should have if you meditate on a very regular basis. Uh, I mean, if you just Google benefits of meditation, yes. it will give a yeah. million pages, right? Yeah. But for me, this is I have I have had much better health. I have been able to cope through the darker periods of my life much better. Uh, I am a very emotional person and <clears throat> meditation has allowed me to enjoy the emotions and not get swept away by them. I'm not saying I, I have become like some logical machine. I still have emotions. I still get angry. I still cry. I still laugh. Uh, you know, I still feel hurt. All that happens. But um, bitterness is not there. Wisdom comes. You have an emotional upheaval, you don't blame the person. You just say, okay, you taught me something. Thank you. And you move on, yes. you know, so yes. you become much stronger, much more stable, much more centered, and you can therefore enjoy life so much more. Yes. Uh, which is the point. Yeah. Beautiful. For more on how to find calm and freedom in a fast paced world, hit the subscribe button below. And please share this wisdom with someone you love.